Hi to everyone. I'm Alessandro Martinelli. I'm the current chair of the Education and Academic Affairs Committee of the IFLA Asia Pacific Region Charter. A um, few months ago, I was tasked by our president, Mrs. Monica Kuo, which is with us today, to try to organize this talk and share dedicated to the topic of education in landscape architecture and the climate change, which is like a, a crucial topic of our discipline in the current years. Since we operate in a fully international global system, our region is perfectly international. I decided to invite uh, some academics from other regions, not to be close just within our region, but also to have inputs from our region. So for this purpose, I invited Claire Martin, which is our chair, or still the chair of the Climate Change Working Group of IFLA APR, to talk to us about what we are doing in the region and how this may connect to education. I invited then Rosalia Munacella, which is like a cutting edge academic teaching professor in uh, uh, GSD Harvard, originally from Australia. So still connected to our region, but operating in another region. And I also invited Elisa Cattaneo, which is professor at the Politecnico di Milano in Italy, Europe. So as you see, we have uh, experts from three different regions participating today to our talk and share. Rosalea is a key person in relationship to landscape architecture education today. She's researching ways of education. She recently published a very nice book uh, published with uh, Routledge addressing design studios and new, way, new ways to teach uh, design studio landscape architecture. She's been active also before in, uh, in the field. Uh, Elisa is also a very important uh, academic. She's researching history and practices in the transformation of landscape with a more holistic point of view, integrating both urban and uh, landscape consideration. And uh, I would say her operational and uh, intellectual background is also different. She's like from uh, Italian uh, heritage. So I hope that the contribution of these three different person today may enrich the debate and also may help us in our region to enlighten us and to understand there are different approaches, but also there may be different resources in, uh, in all the regions around the world facing these topics of education and climate change. So that said, I leave the ground, I leave the floor. I leave the floor to Elisa, which will um, start with her presentation. I should ask both Elisa and Rosalia to quickly introduce yourself before you start, just like the few key important notions so that our public knows uh, who are you beside the words I have given. That said, I leave the floor to Elisa. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro. And thank you to all of you for this uh, uh, amazing invitation. And for me, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I hope to inspire you in some way. I'm Elisa Cattaneo. I'm teaching in the Polytechnical School of Milan, but also in Domus Academy. Uh, what I'm looking in my research and also with my students is uh, new shapes, uh, the possibilities that the criticities that we have in our world could generate uh, looking for new shape, a new imaginary, more or less. And uh, I will start immediately with the presentation. So I don't want to take a, a lot of time to the other speaker. And uh, what I want to present you today is um, a conceptualization about the topic of climate change, because also with my students and in my research, the first step is to understand that the problem has a, 
um, is gen this problem of climate change is generating a new epistemology. So we are changing our philosophical background. Usually in Italy, we work a lot um, with philosophy to precise our topic in design. So what are our philosophical background, new background? What is uh, the short circuits that new philosophers are generating uh, in our languages, in our idea of uh, um, design and so on? And usually what we use are two topics, two, two philosophers, sorry. The first one is Timothy Morton with the concept of hyper object because the climate change is an hyper object. It's something very big that affects everything, but we can see just the effect of the climate change. We can't see really the climate change. And the second is Bruno Latour because uh, uh, in uh, his book, The New Climate Regime and this definition implies uh, a new concept, a new process. The first one is uh, that we are uh, when we design, we are looking for a very big scale with a very small effect. The second, that uh, the question of time is changing because uh, everything, um, the effect of our project is not now, but is in the future, and we have a lot of complexities. So how may we consider the climate change as a, a new possibility, not just a problem, but a new possibility, a pretext to generate new shapes and new methodology? Uh, to do that, uh, we have to consider that in Italy or in Europe, sorry, uh, in Europe, uh, we have uh, a strong background in uh, urban history, urban planning, but I think it's the moment to cut it and to change our genealogy. We have to consider that if we look at the history of planning in the last century, we can use four keywords. The first is the idea of space, then the place and the context, and now landscape, but landscape is a very ambiguous term, is a, a term that has to be uh, built in uh, its uh, concept, in its method, and so on. So what I try to do with students is uh, uh, to change their genealogy in urban studying, passing from our classical idea of planning to a planning that is oriented to uh, natural science. Why? Because uh, we have to ask to the ground, to nature, what kind of information nature can give us uh, or the ground of uh, this uh, calligraphy of our world can give us to generate new a new imaginary. We know that uh, um, nature can give us also solution to generate new imaginary. So uh, what I ask the students is uh, to uh, change our genealogy, to pass from our classical idea of urban study and start to, um, to consider landscape, uh, uh, special landscape or landscape ecology as the new uh, platform. To do that, uh, uh, of course, there are some points, critical points that we have to consider. The first one is in natural science, everything, uh, a project has a lot of scale. Urban, urban design is usually a consequentiality of scale. Now we have to consider multiple scale. We have an overlap in time. We have displacement between cause and effect. We have a morphogenesis approach and not morphological approach in the sense that we have to consider that our project as a landscape architect has to be in evolution. It's always um, a process. No? And to do that, uh, we uh, look at uh, this concept of uh, geontology. So the uh, geology and the, all the science uh, related to the earth are for us uh, the place in which uh, uh, the place uh, we consider has a um, focus for our project. To do that, I formulated uh, this uh, theory that is weakness uh, theory. It's an experiment I do with my students. Uh, weakness is a very interesting word because the etymology of the word weakness is infirmitas. Everything in movement, uh, not stable, uh, without figure, in evolution. Uh, uh, so it's something that uh, um, in its uh, um, etymology is the opposition of our concept of project, our common concept of project is the opposite. So may we stress the idea of process of the idea of project 
as a something always in a dynamics, uh, always in evolution. May we consider fragilities as climate change as potentialities and not just a problem. So as a pretext to generate new shapes, uh, new codes, uh, new taxonomy, new imaginary. And uh, of course, it's a paradox because we have to build this space uh, without architecture. So what I ask to students to generate new spaces without building, uh, without uh, solid spaces uh, and to use nature as technology. Nature is a problem, but nature is also the solution. So uh, to do that, uh, we experiment uh, a lot of uh, uh, project uh, with uh, the students of Polytechnical School of Milan. Uh, we did more or less uh, uh, 1000 experiment using uh, nature as solution for climate change. Uh, and uh, students has to stay in this uh, cognitive map. May we use uh, weakness as nature has new possibility, has new theory, has new method, and has new uh, practice as tools to generate new spaces. So what I ask the students is uh, uh, to design physiological spaces, energetic spaces, spaces in evolution, spaces reversible, suspended, uh, resilient. So the glossary is changing and the students has to answer to this new glossary determined by the new philosophy and the new epistemology that the climate change is uh, bringing in our world, in our world as an architect, but also in our, our world as um, inhabitants of um, the herd. So the student has to move in this conceptual platform and it's an interdisciplinary, it's an hypertext because they have to write, but they have to draw. So it's a, a transdisciplinary approach. And what, the, what we did with the students is to stress also the places. What are the places more affected by the climate change? Because usually climate change is not just a problem of climate, is a problem that involves a lot of different asymmetries. So imbalances in uh, ecology, in, uh, in a social development of a place. Uh, so it's quite complex and it's quite complicated. So when we speak about climate change, we are speaking about an externality, but that implies a lot of other imbalances in our world. So what uh, we did with students is uh, try to map uh, and uh, we use a lot of data. We try to aesthetize data because uh, data give us the possibility to see what is invisible and uh, to pass from a very small scale to a very large uh, one and to understand the interconnection between uh, different places in the world. So what we did is to map uh, all these places that are affected by climate change, but that implies also other asymmetries, a lot of other asymmetries as, uh, for example, uh, problem of pollution, problem of flooding, problem of water, problem of uh, um, social problems and so on. So we try to map it and uh, what we are doing now is to build a matrix of interconnection between uh, these um, problems generated by climate change, how they work together, how they are related in different problem and problematics and how may we codify this problem. It is a way in which we want to uh, draw the world in another way and to see what are the inter interconnections between this global uh, problem. This is an example also in the sea because uh, climate change uh, is a problem not just uh, for the land, but also for the sea. The sea is uh, the place that we want to colonize in the future and the sea uh, is uh, the ocean and the sea is full of information for us because uh, we have a lot of technologies, uh, there are a lot of political and social implications. So we are looking to this uh, uh, new land to experiment, land uh, even if uh, it's water, but um, because we consider landscape as an explorative discipline, so a discipline that allows us to understand better our contemporary. So this is uh, some, those are some maps uh, on, the, um, on the sea. And this is the process that usually we use with students. But uh, to be more precise, the process that I use with students is done by five theoretical and conceptual steps. The first one, students has to 
rewrite a theoretical genealogy, a conceptual genealogy, so they have to rebuild in a way or build in a new way our history of planning. So they um, at first uh, generate a very strong bibliography, very strong uh, um, uh, background of references uh, <coughs> that uh, would be the seeds of the future in a way. The second is a global interaction. When we have a place, when we have to draw in a place, to plan a place, we know that for climate change and this kind of high project, there is always an interaction in a global way. So they have to be in mind that everything has a global effect. Everything is connected in a global effect as the butterfly effect of, of Lawrence, more or less. And then they have to compare all the similar places in the world. So it's not just a question to solve a small pieces of land. It's just a question that that piece of land is, is connected to all the other. And um, there are similar places. So each problem, each um, project could be a hologram, a prototype of how, how to act in similar places. Then the students has to um, ask to the ground information, what kind of information nature can give us. Uh, the, um, the geologics uh, is uh, one of the main uh, places that we ask uh, for uh, new figures, new patterns, uh, what kind of information we can have uh, from the ground, from the air, considering that ecology is a three-dimensional space. And um, the other question that they have to solve is the question of time. Ecology is uh, more related to the question of, of time more than space. So how many times we have when we want to speak about a, a, a project related to ecology. Then they have to generate an epigenetic landscape. Uh, what I want by students is not uh, a project of landscape, but it's a potential shape that could generate a lot of different landscapes. So it's a suspended uh, path between ecology and landscape. And this step is full of possibilities. Why? Because uh, um, ecological project or landscape project is a probabilistic project. It's not something fixed and systemic as the project of architecture. So in this moment, in this suspended moment, I have a lot of different scenarios that I can generate. Also because it's impossible to review exactly what will happen in nature. So for that, uh, I focus a lot on this concept of epigenetic landscape, and then students have to generate a landscape machine, a machine that allows us to move the elements uh, in the project to change the scenarios, to change the scale. So the process of the project is something dynamic, in movement, not fixed. It's a potential uh, landscape. And uh, we work a lot in this, uh, pro in this step, in this suspended place between ecology and the landscape. Now I show you briefly some um, images, some experiment <coughs> that I did with the students. As you can see, they had to map uh, uh, systematic, systematically all the um, world, uh, all the place in the world that has the same problem uh, of the place that uh, they are, uh, they have to solve. So there, there is a lot of spatial comparison. So how a place is affected to this kind of asymmetries, what kind of asymmetries or problem um, could be comparable with the other. Then uh, the pattern in Italy or in Europe, uh, we work a lot on the concept of figure that is something fixed. The pattern is something in movement. So they work in this unstable pattern um, of the ground or of the air. Those are some drawings done by students and we use this kind of uh, drawings as a, a master plan more or less, uh, or uh, for example, in the topic of water, some pattern in dynamics, uh, how they work in time, how is the evolution uh, in time. It's important for us to have uh, always these metrics uh, of uh, complexities, how a climate problem uh, implies a lot of different other problems, social problem or um, I don't know, uh, water problem or other ecological problems. So this is the metrics, we citize also uh, the metrics. 
and uh, uh, the epigenetic landscape. So a potential project uh, that can have in itself uh, multiple scale, uh, it's dynamic, it's performative because it has to ask to, uh, it has to answer to a specific problem, but it has to be ready to be, uh, to generate a lot of uh, different scenarios. So it's a potential master plan. So we are very far from the common idea of master plan and drawings uh, uh, that always uh, we use in urban studies. Those are some examples of our uh, potential epigenetic landscape. And this is the machine that for us is the final results uh, of the process of uh, a project. And the machine is, give us the possibility to move the elements, to consider the uh, process of um, design something uh, uh, always in change. We can change some elements, we can change the master plan, we can change the process. Those are some images. Uh, with the students, uh, after that, after the machine, students can generate one of the possible scenarios and can, they can go deeply in a possible landscape generated by this uh, ecological machine. Those are some examples. Uh, very shortly, I want to show you uh, the last experiment that uh, we did. Those are uh, experiment of students. This is quite important for me, is the last master thesis I was supervisor. And uh, it's quite interesting because of, uh, the students mapped all uh, um, the places uh, involved in the problem of climate change in light of uh, refugee camps. So place in which we have uh, a strong social problem, but also a strong ecological problem. And as you can see, uh, they have generated the three-dimensional epigenetic landscape, a three-dimensional space in which I have all the social and ecological information. And this is the master plan. And what is interesting for me is that the master plan is full of information. If I zoom in or zoom out, I change the level of information of the uh, master plan landscape. And it's something dynamic. It's not fixed, something that I can evolve in time. I can change in place. Uh, so it's something that is very far from our idea of planning uh, uh, that always we used in uh, urban planning, for example, disciplines. So this is the last experiment that we did, and this is another experiment more connected to um, an architectural design process. So uh, at the end of my presentation, this is the process that we use, uh, and I think uh, uh, the focus is that we consider uh, landscape has an explorative discipline. It's not something fixed, uh, it's a new ocean that we have to explore. To do that, we want to find a new figure, new process uh, to try to test as an experiment uh, um, landscape uh, in its uh, taxonomy, in its codification, in its uh, drawing, in its tool and so on. And this is the process more or less that we do with, uh, with the students. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you, Alyssa, for those great insights. I think there's um, a lot that's highly relevant to IFLA and to our member associations as we are all trying to navigate time and scales across multiple territories. And I think obviously the idea of, um, as you have said, the idea of diverse and evolving philosophical backgrounds, I think um, for an organization that spreads across 77 different nations. Um, and I think also highly relevant to obviously what we're talking about tonight and more broadly in terms of education about the idea of seeing fragility as potentialities um, and whether that might actually be in some ways the superpower of landscape and or the design of landscape and ecology. So I think it's really exciting, thank you. Um, I'm now going to introduce Dr. Rosalia Monacella, a faculty member of the Landscape Architecture Programme at, Har at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Her expertise is in carefully indexing and shifting and the shifting of dynamic resource flows that inform the landscape of the city. Her design research practice explores the notion of the thickened ground through a careful and rigorous investigation of an expanded ecology of economic, ecological and social systems that shape the meta meta metabolic and material flows of the city, speculating on alternative near future cities and how they might respond to climate change 
changing resource flows and ecologies of energy. Thank you, Rosalia. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Claire, um, and the opportunity to participate today. It's an honour to be part of the IFLA Asia Pacific Region Talk and Share series. I'll talk about the about design education, specifically through the book that I co-edited with Bridget Kane, Designing Landscape Architectural Education, Studio Ecologies for Unpredictable Futures. I want to acknowledge the 33 contributions, my co-editor Bridget Kane and Rob Sheehan, who without their collaboration, the book would not have been possible. The work on this book commenced a number of years ago. However, for the most part, this book was produced during the first year of the pandemic. A multitude of stories, insights, analyses, and concerns have attached themselves to our collective experience of the pandemic. One striking and persistent effect of the pandemic has been to evidence drastic systemic inequities across the globe, not least some of the very inequities that are frontline effects of the climate crisis. This continuing experience made incredibly clear those who are the most vulnerable and that, view, and that view brings into more direct light the global collective pursuit required to address the climate crisis. Designing landscape architectural education, studio ecologies for unpredictable futures is intended to accomplish two primary purposes. The first is to serve as a resource for academic practitioners um, oops, sorry. The first is to serve as a resource for academic practitioners in preparing and delivering design studio courses. The second is to serve students seeking guidance and insight into design methodologies as part of their landscape architectural education. The work of the publication focuses on the manifold issues of the climate crisis. It asks designers and academic practitioners to describe their own work through an ecological lens. Oh. Sorry, is that is that not showing? I was about to say sorry, Rosalie. We can't, I can't see. Oh, that. Sorry, so I was just trying to check if other people could. I didn't want to let you go too far. Okay, I'll share again. Apologies. Um, Claire, let me know if it comes up, please. Uh -huh. Is that okay? No, I can't, I can't see it. I don't think the others can either. Ah, okay, it no. looks like it's starting. Oh, yes. yeah. Great, oh, thank so, you. Sorry. Um, apologies, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so I'll just go to the... Apologies. Um, so, oh, so the primary purpose of the book is to first serve as a resource for academic practitioners in preparing and delivering design studio courses. The second is to serve students seeking guidance and insight into design methodologies as part of their landscape architectural education. The work of the publication focuses on the manifold issues of the climate crisis. It asks designers and academic practitioners to describe their own work through an ecological lens and then to articulate design approaches for developing new practices in landscape architecture teaching and research. research. A focus on design studio pedagogies is foregrounded as it positions the design studio as the pivot point for coalescing and synthesizing knowledge derived from other courses. Landscape architecture as a discipline needs to evolve rapidly as it responds to both broadening and intensifying changes in environmental, social and political conditions. These changing conditions require development and innovation in the core competencies of landscape architects. This book addresses two fundamental questions. First, what are the skills required of landscape architects to equip them to deal with the complexities brought forth by the climate crisis? And how can we design the education of future practitioners. The book is organised into five parts. Part one, material ecologies. Part two, generative lineages. Part three, generative processes of fieldwork. Part four, senses and landscapes. And part five, expanded ecologies. 
The work are organized within parts with the understanding that no singular holistic view is possible. The intention was not to construct a unifying position or to integrate disparate approaches. The aim was to establish threads of inquiry and to simulate generative and multiple gatherings and seepages. Each thread describes through lenses of ecological thinking, design methods and techniques that engage innovatively with key professional skills of site analysis, field work, material investigation and design processes. I should emphasize that the contributions reflect situations in the global north. These places and institutions have different type of work to do given shared leg legacies of imperial colonial action that are collectively responsible for the climate crisis. As a guide, each part is introduced by an allegorical interlude. They were an attempt to emphasize that the climate crisis, the practices of landscape architecture and pedagogical approaches in the global north belong to intertwined legacies. These narratives provide an orientation towards unpicking, otherworlding and rewiring as actions for the future. Material Ecologies examines ecological thinking from a material perspective with contributions from authors such as Zanetta Hong, who have explored ecology as responsive and evolving set of systems. I'll just read a short passage from Zanetta's chapter where she states, that as landscape architects, urban planners and designers, we are becoming increasingly mindful of the material practices that are embedded in our disciplines and to an awareness of how manufacturing and construction of interrelated at multiple scales, influenced by multiple species and conducted across multiple territories. She states, our knowledge and skill sets provide us with agencies to systematize people, communities and environments to alter atmospheres and alter hydrospheres and lithospheres and ultimately to shape and alter living matter into corporeal realities and speculative futures. This multifaceted and multidimensional enterprise acknowledges the interconnectivity of systems and ecologies that exist in the design and planning of the built landscape. And for both practice and pedagogy, a substantial emphasis is placed on translating the disciplines, production of design spaces and artifacts with material affordance and cultural substance. Zanetta states that in other, in other words, landscape architecture is a discipline that is uniquely positioned to synthesize the immaterial and material, to catalyze a design from individual components and assemblies into well-informed spaces and shared experiences. The next part, generative lineages, explores pedagogical practices that critique imperial knowledge systems and extend upon or intertwine diverse lineages within the extents of the discipline that project into multiple variations of practice. Generative processes of fieldwork focuses, focuses on techniques of observation. Contributors offer approaches in which the relation between observer and the subject is a form of co-production. I'll use Lena Cho's chapter as an example. Reading um, abstracts from Lena's chapter, she states, above anywhere else on the planet, Arctic landscapes are well positioned to take on this call. Vibrant and storied landscapes of Arctic cannot be understood without first decoding their relationships to climate. Extreme and amplified weather conditions, such as frigid weather and prolonged seasonal darkness, coupled with anxieties and prospects afforded by climate change, permeate extensively through both the historical and contemporary fabrics of the Arctic landscape. In this context, fieldwork in the Arctic serves as a designed encounter with extreme and plural climates. It emerges directly out of the fully embodied, immersed experience of an amplified weather world, providing a productive contrast to the climate norm familiar to students. The time spent in the field, however, brings an immeasurable insight for developing both the design tools and techniques on which students can draw. It also establishes for the students an awareness of what extreme places offer, the mental reorientation to sharpen their senses on how the landscapes materialize and the methodological recalibration to successfully probe, register and, act, and enact in them. Site information provided by the studio is intentionally limited 
Instead, the studio asks students to generate their own site material data to guide their creative processes. They adopt a set of instruments, such as thermal imaging cameras, soil probes, Arduino sensors, 3D, 3D scanners that can directly engage with the climate field. Students' evolving framework strategizes are grounded in the fact that climate as an idea is diverse, multiple and transcendental. Climate can mean many different things. It evokes seemingly unrelated but deeply connected concepts in time and has a resonating power in and beyond its physical and material manifestations that can be far reaching. Throughout the studio trip, students gather factual, sensorial, spatial and anecdotal data outside their fieldwork locations to examine ideas of climate multidimensionality. Moving to the next part, sensing landscapes, offers contributors a platform for posing modes of observation and simulation. But the on the ideal and natural flow that shift the perceived inert view of the, land, of the landscape. And in the final section, which Elisa contributed to, expanded ecologies considers the relationship between drivers of the climate crisis and their economic valuation models and social and political systems. Contributors to the, in this section explore ways of embedding new value systems that declare a shift from current paradigms of production. These parts are bookended by the introduction, pseudo ecologies, and the conclusion, tending to matters of ethics of ground. In the introduction, the book, book posits a declaration of ethics of the landscape architecture design studio. The design projects that follow such a declaration would see the learning process imbued with direct and implied effects of design on society and the biosphere. It would see a conscious integration into design studio pedagogy of the agency of the designer in managing those effects. The aim is to ingrain design ethics and ecological thinking into how design studios are pedagogically framed and delivered and to contribute to the academic positioning of each design project. This is then followed by three suggested design studio models. Three overarching models of pedagogical thinking and knowledge production set the stage for how to reconfigure the landscape architecture design studio. Model for ecological and ethical entanglements, model for interactivity, and model for reconfigurations. These models draw upon the collection of approaches captured in five parts. They're not to be considered as discrete models, but as potential modulations of the design studio pedagogy. And in the conclusion, tending towards a matter of ethics of ground, the book and its contributors argue that business as usual approach in design education will be inadequate to face the challenges of the climate crisis. Therefore, a deep reconsideration of the role of design and the designer is required is a required starting point for adapting the curriculum. This conclusion takes the form of a series of principles for tending to and matters of that enable a different approach to those primarily facilitate the acquisition of skills. These actions create the conditions for the emergence and refinement of qualities that are ways to approach design, that allow for engagement with the complexity of the climate crisis. The emphasis on ecological thinking across the book's five sections gives rise to a number of thematic matters of concern, each described as calls to action that formulate principles for tending to. The act of tending to describes ways in which actions may be engendered. As a form of making tending to implies care, empathy and accountability towards other humans and beyond human centric endeavors. It implies an ongoing reflective pedagogical practice that signals a shift from modes of production to actions that prioritize cultivation for the design studio teaching. Tending to matters of mutability, the matter of concern is with current governance systems, institutional structures and infrastructural determinism that emphasise rigidity and resistance to change due to the persistence of archaic legal systems and codes that hark back to periods of white settlement when land was considered terra nullis, nobody's land. These impediments continue to repeat and reinforce injustice. 
Tend tending to matters of reciprocity, the matter of concern is in imperial knowledge systems that include geology, ecology, and biology. Historically, these systems have object objectified species and constricted understanding through flawed measures inherited and acquired of traits, fitness, and reproduction. Tending to matters of exactitude, the matter of concern is with projected systems of measure. Cartographic systems, such as geographic information systems, that have constructed a particular view of the world through coordinates and geometric projections. These systems of measure are often driven by prospecting for capital accumul accumulation, extraction, and surveillance. Tending to matters of novel agents, the matter of concern is the current value systems we impose on non-living systems, such as, such as carbon offsetting that gives license to continue current modes of living that avoids accountability for polluting the environment and that induces large scale ecosystem loss. The studio environment, tending to matters of multiplicity, the matter of concern is the studio environment that historically emulates and serves corporate and private practice models that consequently enforce singular design approaches and models of learning. The institution, tending to matters of collectivity, the matter of concern is with current institutional models that support hierarchical modes of labour, segregated modes of knowledge production, and the paradigm of ongoing wealth accumulation. And finally, here is an example of moving from matters of concern to tending to. Tending to matters of collectivity argues for a shift from singular domains of practice and demarcated borders. It cultivates formations of territorial and knowledge commons, cooperative structures and assembling in Krogowitz fields charged with the purpose of change through co-production. These goals are achieved through actions that frame practice in academia as a continuum with modes of learning and research outcomes specific to each. Advocate for alignment of labour structures of institutions to support exploratory and ongoing work and endorses students as critical collaborators, definers of future practice. Create plurality of approaches along with their lineages and subsequent emerging specialisations. So this has just been a brief snapshot of the future directions of landscape architecture design education and this again predominantly from a, a North American perspective. I'd like to thank again everyone who's contributed to the book. I very much look forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Rosalia. I think, yeah, again, very interesting and to see some of the similarities in particular, I guess, around the emphasis on, on predictability. And then again, if we think about this from an IFLA perspective on the importance of interrelatedness and plurality. And I think also the idea of the importance of recontextualizing design as an ethical project in the context of climate change, which is something that we all have to navigate. Um, and I think, again, that you sort of really hit upon what I think is probably one of the hidden values of landscape architects and landscape architecture in the sense of it is our, our ability to synthesize especially again in the context of those new value systems that you mentioned so I think that's all exceptionally relevant for all the work that we are all doing in all aspects of landscape architecture or the work we could be doing as well. Um, thank you. So I'll now introduce myself so my, my name is Claire Martin and I'm a registered landscape architect and an Associate Director of Oculus in Australia. I'm a Fellow and an Immediate Past Special President of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects and the current IFLA Asia Pacific Region Climate Change Working Group Chair. Um, and so it's in that context that I'll speak to you this evening, but before I begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Wadri Warren people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the unceded land in which I speak to you all today. Thank you. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So this presentation is very much about um, the global um, working group, but as a chair of the Asia Pacific Working Group, it's really important to emphasize that we are part of this global network. Um, and I think that is probably the unique strength of IFLA is that we do bring a profession together or parts of the profession together. And so these are the working group members who have contributed to the agenda that I'll um, just step you through. So this is really very much an update of where we're at and some of the priorities for this year. And I think there are many hooks in what I'm presenting in relation to education, if we see education not simply as tertiary education, but I guess as lifelong learning as a continual 
mode of reflection. Um, next slide, thank you. So I think in 2022, we developed what's called the IFLA Climate Action Commitment. If we go to the next slide, thank you. So that really was um, linking, I think, linking IFLA's emphasis with, in particular, the sustainable design goals and the UN. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, so it's really saying that we have a unique opportunity as an organisation to try and gather together 70,000 landscape architects from around the world and to see that we could collectively take action both as global citizens, um, but also as design practitioners in all senses of the word to limit planetary warming to one and a half percent. And so I'll step you through in a minute some of the um, things that that meant, but if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so this is the drafting team and we included this image because it just shows, um, again, did have a, a particular emphasis um, probably from North America, but we brought together people from Australia and from North America and people um, and um, Kochkom Vorokom, who is the IFLA Working Group, Climate Change Working Group Chair. Um, and we brought these people together to write this action commitment. And this was to write that ahead of COP and it was really just to try and galvanise around key issues. If we go to the next um, slide, thank you. And so again, that aligned to the COP. The next slide, thanks. And so that in particular, I think was um, Coach Korn was able to attend that because of her own um, work as a landscape architect, but I think it was really pivotal to have a presence there. And what we've understood is that we have one of, I think in that instance, she was one of only, probably only her that attended as a landscape architect. And certainly in this year's COP, there were probably only had two landscape architects that attended. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. This is just really putting in the context, I guess, of um, so obviously a landscape architect who has trained both in the region and uh, um, in the US, but who very much practices um, within the Asia Pacific region and is internationally renowned and I think respected um, in particular for her unique position. But um, I think her emphasis on leaving no one behind, I think is really critical. But I think she's a very um, powerful design advocate. And I think IFRA is obviously very fortunate and in particular for Asia Pacific to have been able to nominate Culture corn into that role. And I think that she is very passionate about the, the role of IFLA in trying to advocate for the role of landscape architects in particular to government. And so that's why we um, put emphasis of her attending COP. If we keep going, next slide, thanks. And so this just is an example where we are linking with Architecture 2030. So, and that links then back to some of the work of ASLA, but again, trying to make those connections where if they can have peer-to-peer -peer connections and leverage, um, I guess, the established relationships that other organisations have with the United Nations. So again, trying to get landscape architecture within a built environment context to understand the relevance of what it is that we're doing to help with both adaptation and mitigation. Go to the next slide, thank you. So as a result of doing the commitment um, to climate action and then also the attendance of COP, we facilitated the first, um, what was called a building resilience um, talk series. So again, a little bit like this talk series where we, all of the chairs that you can see um, of the regions and the two co-chairs of the group were asked to facilitate discussions that teased out some of the topics that we, uh, that formed the big thematics of the climate action plan. We go to the next slide, thank you. And so this was the idea of, I guess, building resilience in particular um, is obviously is a general um, underarching sort of concept, but the idea of aligning to the sustainable development goals, like we can be critical of this, but I think that's something that IFLA has aligned to for a long time. And so the idea was that we would really be able to try and champion that. I think the idea in particular around design, designing for drawdown is particularly a, an emphasis on especially through Pamela Conrad's work, an emphasis on um, trying to minimise the amount of, climate, uh, of carbon in the work that we do, as well as to actually, um, yes, a general reduction in operational and embodied carbon emissions. So this is really trying to educate. Um, so I guess an education of members, whether they are students, graduates or um, practitioners, about the importance of doing that. I mean, we have a very carbon intensive profession in many ways. So this is, I think, a massive piece of education and advocacy within our profession that we need to really skill up. And then if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the third one was around um, 
I guess, the idea of enhancing capacity and resilience of livable cities and communities. And I think much of what Rosalia and um, Melissa have spoken about can work at multiple scales. And I think that idea of working at large scale, whether it's nationwide, regionally, or at a city scale is really critical. And in particular, targeting urban heat island and risks associated with fire, drought and floods. So again, these are speakers from all over the world that came together to talk on these topics. So again, that idea of plurality in different contexts and different cultural contexts and socio-political contexts is really critical to share and to learn from. And then um, the last one I think, or the penultimate one is, um, was around opportunities for climate justice and well-being in landscape architecture. So we know that this is um, probably still I think undercooked in many ways. And so this idea of being able to provide greater support, and I know obviously Rosalie was alluding to the idea of the global north. And so I think this is really critical if we're to look at something that is ultimately the responsibility of much of the global north and the impacts on the global south. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, thank you. We also put um, an emphasis on learning from cultural knowledge systems. So I facilitated a discussion um, with different with landscape architects at different stages of their career, all indigenous landscape architects and a landscape architectural student. And so I think it's really understanding the value of cultural land management knowledge to mitigate climate change impacts and also as a contribution towards working towards reconciliation. So I think understanding whether it's philosophical, cultural, or spiritual value of knowledge systems. And then lastly, the idea of galvanizing climate leadership. And I think again, as the other speakers have alluded to, this is an opportunity for um, educators, for all forms of practitioners to demonstrate this leadership. And much of what we are trying to do is bring everyone to do that so that we demonstrate a more of a collective capacity. Um, next slide, thank you. And so then we'll just skip through these ones, but I think this was just, again, another way of if we go to the next slide, trying to focus on 13 female landscape architects who are leading the fight as it's described against climate change. So this is really trying to profile women from um, a range of backgrounds and practices to go to the next slide um, from countries all over the world who are really contributing um, in very different social, ecological and cultural contexts. And so this is an attempt to try and showcase that and we will be doing another version of that this year. Uh, next slide, thank you. And so 2023 is really about whether we can then try and um, again get support to attend COP28 in Dubai. And so this really means, I think last time, as I said, there were only perhaps two landscape architects that we understood were there. And so much of what we will try and do is to build content that could then create a platform for having a more meaningful presence at COP. If we go to the next slide, and again, thank you. So this was, excuse those. But um, this was actually about um, being able to work with, for example, the Thai Pavilion this year. So I think the idea is that we want to use these opportunities to connect with our members to try and identify opportunities, whether it's through UN Habitat, whether it's through each association's pavilion, to have more of a presence in a platform. Next slide, thank you. Oh, it's going um, and so this would be the second series. So again, we are very open to receiving um, input in terms of people, topics that people would like to speak on. Um, again, we have academics, we have practitioners, and we have emerging landscape architects. So the idea of this series, um, we will start to facilitate more talks along the same themes. Um, and again, trying to educate, but also build capacity. Next slide, thank you. And then again, the Women and Earth Day. So I think an emphasis on women, knowing that women are disproportionately affected and adversely impact, impacted by climate change. So this remains an, um, an important emphasis of the group. So this was something that will be trying to work with the IFLA Secretary on uh, both at a regional level and globally. Next slide, thank you. And then I think something that is really important to us and something that has already started as discussions is how we're involving younger landscape architects in this conversation. And in particular, if we go to the next slide, there are various mechanisms within IFLA for young, like the Young Leadership uh, Leaders Alliance, but there are different ways that you can contribute as a younger member um, of your association. And so this is really, I think we're also very, if we go to the next slide, thanks, very interested in how we start to connect or harness the connections that are already being made between young people within the built profession. So whether it's in architecture, 
whether it's in ecology, landscape architecture, so how they're already speaking with each other and how they may choose to collaborate very differently to perhaps their predecessors. So really just trying to work out how we can emulate these sorts of good initiatives from COP27 to the COP28 in particular. Next slide, thank you. And this is just some of the images from the Thai Pavilion example. Next slide, thank you. And so if I'll end on this, but this is one that really relates very much to what um, the other speakers are talking about. And I think there are many academics involved within IFLA and from very diverse backgrounds. And I think the idea is that we would really, really want to use whatever mechanisms are already in place within our respective associations and organisations, as well as those within AILA, IFLA, other to um, develop what would, we would say is a series of design case studies that can then be drawn on to create a UN climate design implementation guideline. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. So to start, we are trying to also propose that we would rename our group from Climate Change to Climate and Biodiversity Working Group. And this we think is really important given the um, dual crises. Um, and then thank you, to then also look at how we can look at national um, adaptation plans, so how we could use these case studies to help develop, um, help work with the UN on the development of those plans. Next slide, thank you. And so these implementation guidelines would then be drawing on best practice examples that don't just have to be built, they can be research based or speculative, but trying to actually make connections between everyone's great work to help with these sorts of implementation challenges. Next slide, thank you. I think this is my last slide. Um, so the idea is to publish this through UN Adaptation NAP, um, and it really is about trying to get uh, governments to better understand, I guess, the role of landscape architects in the implementation of nature-based solutions, and obviously identifying the different needs in different regions, whether it's from drought, flood, fire, agricultural challenges, heat and biodiversity. And so these um, case studies will be drawn, as I said, from the global south and the north. Um, and as I said, don't have to be implemented, but could be speculative um, or research based. And this will be quite a succinct document and a high level document. But the idea is that that can then link back to those other case studies and that we are also having separate conversations about the idea of creating geo databases where we can again build on some of the great work that's already happened across the regions. Um, but this is just really to give you a sense of how we want to educate. I guess we're seeing education not just as the education of people who may choose to practice landscape architecture, but the continual education of ourselves as a profession and the education of our clients and the people that we work with in government. Um, and I guess that bigger advocacy piece, so the role of education and communication and design advocacy. And I think that's it. So I might leave it there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Before the Q&A starts, I would like to ask to Rosalia and Elisa just a few simple clarifications for our public, considering that uh, we need to, we need, our framework is fully international. I would like you to tell our public, first, the work you have shown to us, the diagrams, the drawings, they are produced by students from bachelor, master, diploma, other level, which kind of level? The second, the ratio of excellence. So the best percentile of your student, how many? And then the third one, I will give you a sentence and I would like you to confirm or not. I believe that in the work you have shown to us and in the work you do with the students, there are big components of aesthetic research, how to make the drawings, how to make the diagrams, how to make the images you've shown as beautiful. And this is also part of the research you're doing with the students. Is that correct? These three questions for me are key to let our public and have a more clear picture of what is going on. Thank you. It's not for q and I just would like to have this clarification for the sake of uh, internationalization. May I answer? 
Thank you. So about the students, uh, in my case, uh, those are master students. Uh, and I think it's important that they work in the master course on these topics uh, because before in the bachelor, they have to know and they have to learn uh, the background of urban studies also. Because if you have to fight with a strong scheme of modernity, you have to know that. So those are adults students, more or less. Uh, the second, uh, um, I think uh, um, the, the percentage of uh, students, uh, I don't know, the students more or less are quite strong uh, because of the selection of uh, uh, the master program is uh, strong and competitive. Uh, so I don't know, this, uh, to be sincere, the percentage of students, uh, I think uh, usually in a class we have 10% uh, very strong. So strong that maybe they could access to uh, other strong pro uh, program has, for example, um, program of uh, codification at Columbia University. It happens that after this master thesis, uh, the student can have access to other program, higher and more complex. Third, about aesthetics, uh, in my case, uh, it is uh, sure in the sense that uh, to find an aesthetics is to codify some reasons uh, and some process. So aesthetics is not just for itself, uh, but it's uh, a way for finding new codification of a problem. For example, the students usually use just vector because vector are something related to mathematics. Uh, it's not rhetoric, it's not narrative, it's uh, a way to transform science in art. So the question of aesthetics uh, through drawings uh, drawings uh, in this way, they don't use colleges, for example, they don't use uh, this kind of instruments. Uh, um, it's a way to codify our contemporary idea of project. So it's tactics is crucial in my case, uh, in the case of uh, my students, uh, they did these kind of drawings that I show you. Okay. Um, just in terms of, oh. Just in terms of the um, the work that I showed, all the, the work that was captured in the book is predominantly postgraduate students, so from the master's program. Um, I am to answer your question of what percentage. Um, I, I I couldn't give you in terms of what I showed you. I, I'm not sure where they're situated in terms of marking. Um, but then coming back to um, the question of representation, um, I, I'd argue that all facets of the design studio are brought into question. So whether it's the way that fieldwork is undertaken or the how you, we understand information, which Elisa sort of um, talks about quite clearly, um, or even the way that we construct images is, is actually one that we need to consciously question. Um, and sort of the the, I guess the historical sort of lineages that they come from, but also what they they imply in the future. Elisa, uh, I have following the question: Is your uh, master students is the international students or just the the students that come from Italy? No, they are international students, uh, so okay, they uh, come from all the world. Uh, uh, more from um, China uh, because Politecnico has a strong relationship with China and uh, yeah. from uh, Iran, uh, from South America and uh, North uh, Africa, more or less, yeah. or Russia also. So those are international uh, students uh, and some Italian also. That's great. So we can see the global, you know, spectrum you know, about different culture and the geography, right? Yeah. But it's very interesting, uh, and I think it's important that they are international because uh, since we are looking a new background, uh, they are at the same level in, in a way with the same uh, global problems uh, uh, to answer. So we don't work in a specific historical elements. We work in something that involves all the people in the world. So I think it's important that uh, they are international and yes, they are master students of international um, course. Okay, great. Thank you. So Alice, um, will you elaborate more on? In theory, I should not participate in this Q&A. Um, 
So I just wanted to give this simple question to clarify, because yes. the viewers, our public, think that the product you know, that was shown is for batch, from Bachelor. Most of the students in our region, as a Pacific region, normally are within the Bachelor programs, not in the Master program when we talk about landscape. So this also may, led, uh, may lead to some misunderstanding. That's why I wanted them to clarify. Also, the percentile question was to tell, because I'm sure that the work we have seen, it is from the best. So how much is the best? If you have one, one over 100 people, well, it's, it's a good reference because we know where we want to go, but it doesn't give us an understanding of what are the students doing in general. And the third one, because I know that in the Chinese speaking world environment, the question of aesthetics is not as in the European or Western countries. So the idea that there is like an uh, autonomous production or there is some kind of aesthetics that we follow or we need to produce is not so straightforward. So that's why I wanted them to clarify that the research is not only in the landscape as, a, as ecology, yeah, as so the reality, but is also in the way we show the data, in the way we understand the data, in the way we prepare some drawings. So I just want them to clarify these two aspects, which are with three aspects, which are very important yeah. for people to understand. But I leave the floor also to, to Claire, also you to Monica. If you have like specific questions to Rosalia, to Elisa, I think that that's very important moment. Rosalia is a very important academic at GSD Harvard, probably the best university when we talk about landscape. Elisa is one of the leading university in Europe. Spotechnico Milano is one of the best. So we, we have like a very good understanding. And also Claire is, you know, former president of ILA. So <laughs> she knows what's going on in Australia, which is very strong in landscape too. I don't have any questions, but I think there are some good questions in the Q&A that I think it would be oh. great to pose. So okay. Monica, are you, are you happy to do that? I think it would be great to get them to respond to those questions. Okay. So uh, I think we saw some questions from the blog. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. I, I think everyone should be able to see it. Okay. How do you think of the landscape architect uh, confronting the earth and climate change? We should adjust our mindset. But at the same time, how can we make a fair balance between the current law and the conventional public work performance? I think anyone can, you know, answer or feedback to this. Uh, I can maybe start, Elisa. Yeah, please, Rosella, yeah. Um, well, I guess one thing, so from a pedagogical perspective, um, I guess one thing, um, I guess the the book and also my from my teaching experience um, is that the current systems or codes or um, laws that are in place come from a very particular um, understanding of the landscape from a historical perspective. So they were generated quite a while ago. Yeah. So I think one of the things that um, the book suggests and also um, from my own teaching experience it suggests is that we need to critically question them. Yeah. And so from our designs perspective, from our sort of, you know, the way that we approach teaching is that we not only sort of look at, we, look, we understand sort of the broader implications so how our design actually might influence or change some of these laws um, or bring to light the, the problematic nature of some of them as well. So um, I think you can't sort of, I guess what I'm suggesting is you can't sort of assume that they're just a given. I think we need to be conscious about their implications. Yeah. Their origins. Right. Great. Uh... How about Elisa? You would like to echo to this question? Um, may you repeat? Because I was reading um, and answering to uh, writing to a question. May you repeat? Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, we have the second question. Uh, 
Well, actually, we relate to both of you. The weak field and the sickness ground concept are quite a complex, but actually it shows the wide spectrum of environmental ethics and the professional uh, practice. So can any of the speakers can elaborate more on this? It's really quite interesting question. I think uh, uh, at least I'm saying, you know, uh, landscape architecture can create a space without architecture. So maybe that's why you say the weakness, right? Yes, uh, to build the, it's a paradox. Uh, I think it's important in a way to find uh, um, new. There is this philosopher that uh, I use a lot as reference. The name is a, is a post-structuralist philosopher, French philosopher, that is Gilles Deleuze. It is one of the benchmark for European culture. He says yeah. that to build something, new concept, you have to use two instruments. One is the paradox and one is the game. And the paradox, uh, as in the case of weakness, uh, to build space with a body is a... I think it's a positive paradox because it forces us to imagine something totally new in a way. How may I build a space that I can inhabit without a body of architecture? How mm -hmm. may I understand that ecology is a three-dimensional space that I'm in, but I can see it? And the paradox is also to think about the project that is not for now in this time, but maybe is for someone in the future. And maybe uh, it's not, uh, our project is not the solution now, in the sense that maybe our project can uh, be resolutive for a place that is very far from us. So mm -hmm. I think that the idea of weakness, uh, uh, that is not uh, a fragile architecture, but is uh, a way to, um, to force, uh, the design to go out uh, to our common idea of architecture. So weakness is a pretext. It's a game in a way, no? How may I consider this a game? Weakness is important because it's the opposite of our common idea of architecture. So it forces us uh, to change time, to change the meaning and the sense of our project uh, and to give a new ethics to, your, to our project because maybe these are, uh, uh, very fragile places could be the place of the future because they have a lot of possibilities. We can invent a new generosity for uh, the space that we share, a new idea of city, a new ethics. So it's in a way to think the world in reverse. I don't know. I don't know if I've answered to be sincere to the question. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, you know, it, yeah, Alice. I have a question for um, Rosalia and Lisa and also Claire. And uh, the question starts from the condition of Taiwan and landscape architecture. Now in Taiwan, uh, where I'm living also, where I'm also working, we have a very specific condition that is, we have more than 40 programs between bachelor and master on landscape architecture over a population of 26 million people, which means that landscape is kind of generalist education more than specialist or elitist. We have many students enter this path. It's not just like uh, over like a large number, only few enter like a master uh, research. In this respect, we, we, this also means that the education we can provide, uh, it cannot be um, extremely, um, I would say, specialist. Not all the students have the same background or the same level of the background. I mean, the excellence ratio can be very shallow. So in this respect, and considering climate change, which skills you think may be absolutely crucial to deliver the students when landscape is a generalist education? Considering climate change always. Eh? Mm.
Rosalia, you want to start? Um, thank you. Um, I was just getting my head around 40 programs and 26, and 26 million people. So <laughs> amazing. Um, uh, um, I'd love to know more about the 40 programs. But um, just in response to uh, your question, I, I guess this is maybe I'll, I'll respond to it in a sort of a simple way and then I'll slightly unpack it. Um, I guess when we're designing education and we think of the climate crisis and the complexity of how we understand the climate crisis, one of the things that I would, I would suggest is when we're either as an educator or either as a student, how do we do no future harm? And that, in, that forces us to think about sort of how we structure the information, how we structure the design studio, for example, how do we, what is the information that we deliver? And how do we formulate sort of a design method that again causes no future harm? And so, um, so it might not necessarily be, a, and it's not necessarily a, and this is where I, like, you know, from region to region, we have different sort of issues and accountability. Um, that we need to take into account. Um, and, and by the fact, we're, and when we ask these types of questions, it forces us to sort of not think about the project as this enclosed project that sits in a bubble, but is a part of a whole range of social environmental complexities and effects. Elisa. Yes. I think that very, in a very simple way, what uh, students, what kind of skills they have to learn. The first one, new software, a new way to represent what is invisible. Because ecology is invisible, it's not visible. We can see a part of the ecological system, but uh, we can see the climate change. It is a characteristic of an upper object, no? it's not visible. We see the effect. So to see the invisibility is the first, uh, it implies a QGIS, uh, program or maybe soft parametric design, something that can help us to see what otherwise we can't see. Second, I agree also with uh, Rosalia, there are um, question of complexities. They have to learn that uh, to work on landscape uh, is to work on complexities. It's not one topic. It's uh, more difficult than an architectural topic. It's not to build a museum. It's to understand that there are a lot of interferences uh, in the ecology, in ecological project, a lot of Interferences, different elements with different scales, with different times, and so how can I uh, work uh, all these heterogeneous elements uh, in one project? So to manage the complexities, and then it's important they will learn a new vocabulary, new words. How may I speak for the future? What is the glossary that I have to use? The words that I have to use to educate, also the way that. Uh, uh, in which we speak, it's important from, from an ethics point of view, but it's important from a, a logical point of view. And then uh, I think uh, botanics, because nature is a technology. So maybe we have to do, go deeply in this science that we don't know very well, uh, because usually we use, use nature as aesthetics, but nature is a technology. So to go in another science to understand if uh, we can pass actually from design to botanics uh, to neurobotanics, uh, these kind of things. I think for me, those are the four uh, skills that they, they have to learn. We have five minutes left. Uh, there are several questions. I think the recording should be okay. And uh, what else? Uh, the, the other question is the the but actually I have a question to all of you, you know. Uh, I think I really appreciate uh, the book, you know, uh, uh, the Rosella the book is quite nice, you know, you have a five different spectrum. But in, in the other hand, I'm just questioning about when Alice is talking about, if you have the elite, you know, training, 
but all the students have very high level um, sensitivity and the broad knowledge. But how can we train the very basic foundation for all the practitioner or the educator? They can have a kind of basic, you know, understanding and that kind of stewardship, say, as a designer or cons contractor or constructioner. They have the obligation to promise we have to safeguard the earth. I think they are in different kinds of space or in different kinds of world. So in this, we, you know, when we talk to the, uh, in, in many Asia, you know, country, sometimes people say, you know, in Chinese world, they say human can, you know, conquer everything. But, you know, nowadays, when you're talking about the weakness, we, 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 we should never, you know, believe this. So how can you, you know, a kind of give us a more general recommendation for the more fundamental educational uh, program as well as the training? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, I guess, well, maybe from, from um, I will approach it from firstly, my perspective as sort of an instructor or a teacher. Um, uh, but in terms of the sort of school that I come from, so, um, so the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Landscape Architecture Program here, Right from so right from the start, as the students enter, they're engaging with the complexities of the climate crisis, yeah. whether it's from the notion of a public realm, um, a square, um, understanding sort of the implications of you know heat island effect, or you know inundation of flooding, inundation of um, or social inequities, environmental justice issues, they're engaging with that. Um, and it's all students that participate in that sort of endeavor. It's not just a certain select few. And, and I would also say that um, every facet of the course, whether it's in the history program or the sort of what we refer to as um, environmental and technologies, is that, that the way that the information is actually delivered is understood in a, in a critical way. So the sort of histories that uh, we're understanding sort of the effects of these histories um, uh, and sort of their origins. Um, so, you know, the aspect of redlining, for example. So that sort of becomes very much a part of the dialogue. Um, but then in terms of the book, the conclusion attempts to provide sort of a guideline um, yes. of, uh, of, you know, certain actions um, that could be undertaken. Um, and very clearly sort of outlines that um, and sort of attempts to act as a resource for sort of, um, for students and sort of educators. Um, yeah. But it's also from a multiple perspective. You, like it's this, how we teach it, how we design the, you know, the design studio, the environment that we teach in versus even the information that we deliver. I have found the question in the Q&A, sorry, we, it's just oh, new. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then the public asking two, one question, I think, is Claire trying to reply about how to contact us or how to interconnect with us. The other two, the other two questions are this one. The first, the program and the people change. Can we really change education so fast? Mm -hmm. First, and to adapt to the challenges, of course. The second question is, there are today strong climate scientists. We have like notion like Anthropocene. Um, how can we better connect landscape architecture, academics, and these climate scientists? And then it just came out a third question. Well, this is more for IFLA. They ask us if it is possible for IFLA to broadcast knowledge and information more to the global south, because to reach out to books, reach out to information from the global south is not that easy. I think so we I could 
Actually, I can do that, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I repeat the two questions. First, program change very fast. Uh, people change very fast. Can we adapt programs? And then uh, how can do it? And then the second one is we have climate scientists, how to connect and the, uh, yeah, them. The next architecture. Yeah. I think here we are talking about, you know, we if not trying to reach out to, to the youth. So it's quite important, starting from very basic, you know, fundamental education. So we'd like to have some uh, feedback from Korea, okay? So may I answer? So uh, I think uh, I'm quite uh, radical answering to this uh, question, for example, about the general uh, uh, background that they have to know, they have to learn. I think that at first we have to understand that we are in a new era for the project so maybe we have to start to work together in this experiment uh, and uh, everything we know about the project or the classical way uh, in which we consider the design process is something that is related to the 20th century is not anymore for us is history more or less so we are the general background is that uh, maybe they have to know that they are experimenting something that there is no time for narration or uh, storytelling, but it's time to answer to a real problem. And from this real problem, we can have new scenarios. So I think this is the general background that every student has to learn starting from the bachelor. About the two questions of Alessandro, uh, if uh, the um, teaching uh, process has to change, uh, maybe yes. Maybe we have to be so agile that we have to change our way of thinking, our way of teaching in light of what is happening because the world is changing very fast. And I think to be, uh, I don't know, um, always in the same life of uh, teaching, maybe it's not necessary now. We have to be faster, more experimental, and we have to accept that maybe we have to abandon what we thought before and to change our position and to check our position and to correct our position. About climate scientists, they know a lot of uh, things more than us. So we have to acquire their ability to be scientists uh, and we have to transform what they give us uh, in something that we can live. So I think that we don't have to simulate that we are experts on climate, we are experts on data. We acquire, we accept their studies, uh, and then we have to transform that in a shape that we can live, we can experiment, we can inhabit it, because we are this kind of expert. We are the people that has to build the space that we can inhabit it. Thank you. Because uh, the time is up, you know, uh, I think uh, this issue really is uh, very important. So we hope uh, the talk and share can continue to have the issue about the climate change. But I think as uh, um, president of the EFLI PR, we also say it's Korea, you know, we are actually working very hard in terms of the global, you know, connection and then working about the adapting to the climate change. Also, uh, it's the responsibility, you know, how we can do in different kinds, like in from the education, from the training practitioner. So we like to finally say to it, Elisa, um, was in your career also that says, you know, Alice took to uh, team up this kind of close uh, region and the close, you know, uh, profession. It's quite important. Um, and people are asking, can we have the recording? I think it's no problem. Uh, we're going to uh, keep on the video on our online. So thank you very much. And uh, next, next week is going to be our Chinese Luna year. So happy new year to everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Happy new year. Happy new year. <laughs> bye.